Before we start, I want to kind of make a disclaimer. I'm not an expert in uh, category theory. I pretty much know nothing about it except that it exists. I don't know how many such relationships between category theory things exist, but I just discovered one myself and I just want to share it with you. Some time ago, I decided to try to implement a simple programming language in Haskell and uh, I started with a parser. I decided to not use parsec or any stuff like that. I decided to go uh, manually. So the first thing that I needed is to implement a tokenizer. So for me, a tokenizer would be something that takes a string and returns the list of tokens, right? So the implementation of that particular tokenizer doesn't really matter right now. So we're going to just denote it as a function from string to a list of strings. This tokenizer doesn't really provide any information about the positions of the tokens inside of the input string. So I decided to slightly change the type to make this thing indexed. Then I thought uh, maybe the input of the tokenizer should be indexed as well. So maybe the input should be indexed characters and output should be the list of indexed strings. So then I saw that it looks like a generic type. So I can probably create a type synonym indexed A and basically generalize that idea of an indexed thing. So I want to use some kind of Emacs magic where I match pair and basically do that and capture the, uh, the type inside of the pair and replace it with it not actually with it, but rather with it indexed. Yes, beautiful Emacs magic, by the way. While I was implementing the tokenizer, I realized that inside of the tokenizer, I quite often need a function that takes a list of indexed characters and returns a single indexed string. So, and as you know, string is a type Cinnabon for a character. So yeah, basically, I need to turn this type inside out. So how would I implement it? Imagine that I have an index string of characters. How would I construct it? For example, I have hello and I zip it with indices. So here's the list of indexed characters. I want to turn it into an indexed string. Basically, I want it to look like zero, hello. That's what I want it to look like because zero is the index of the first character and I want it to be carried to the world token just to indicate where this token starts from. So if the list of indexed characters was like starting from four, I want the entire token to look like four just to indicate like the position where the token starts from. That's what I wanted to achieve. So it's, it's actually quite easy to implement. For example, we have a case when the list is empty in this situation, we probably have to throw an error because there's nothing we can take the index for the token from. So I'm going to say the input is empty. And for the rest of the things, uh, we can create a simple pattern that extracts the index of the first element of the list. And then we just compose an indexed string. As the second argument, we have to put access but we have to strip off all of the indices by uh, mapping them with S and D. So this is our implementation. So we take uh, index string and make token out of it. So yeah, it works. So no matter uh, what it starts from, it works like that. Uh, so, but then I noticed that the signature of this particular function looks kind of familiar. It reminds me of functions that called sequence. Specifically, I'm interested in reusing sequence A. Basically, this function takes applicative inside of traversable and returns applicative that contains traversable. So basically, it turns the entire type inside out in the same fashion as we do that in make token. So list is a traversable, but is index an applicative? That's an interesting question. Is index an applicative? Well, if you think about it, it is not because one of the important function of the applicative is pure. Pure function is supposed to take A and wrap it into applicative. But the problem is if you construct indexed out of nothing, what index should you put here? You just don't know. It can be zero, it can be one, it can be two. So you just basically cannot construct an indexed thing out of nothing. But if you take closer at the definition of applicative, you will find an interesting instance of an applicative. So it has a pair, but it's only applicative if the first element of the pair is a monoid. Huh, that's very interesting. And so what is a monoid? Monoid is generally something, it's a 
algebra that has an identity element and a binary operation. So there are many kinds of monoids. Monoids is such a, a simple system and there is many of them. For example, all of the integers plus operation and zero is a monoid because you have a binary operation, right? A simple binary operation and identity element that doesn't modify uh, the element you apply the operation to. For example, you can do one plus zero is going to be one and you can do zero plus one is still going to be one. So zero is an identity element. Another monoid that you can define is integer multiplication one, absolutely the same situation. Five multiplied by one is five and one multiplied by five is five. So it's a, another monoid on integers. You can define uh, all kinds of monoids, for example, on integer infinity and minimum, because if you apply infinity on and minimum on anything, you get back that thing. Pair is applicative only if the first argument is a monoid. But the problem is integer is not a monoid. It does not implement a monoid instance. And it doesn't do that exactly for this specific reason, because integer forms not a single monoid, actually many of them. That's why in Haskell, to describe different kinds of monoids over, over integer, they're usually wrapped with different new types. So I guess I can find all of the important things about monoids in monoid and semigroup. Yeah, I have to remove this thing to actually make it compilable. Okay, so we have thing like sum, which is a monoid over addition and zero. We have product, which is a monoid over multiplication and one. And we have monoids like min and max. What kind of monoid we actually have to put it to turn index type into an applicative. Well, it turns out it just has to be mean. And let's just try to uh, play with it. So now to generate an indexed characters, we have to do mean zero dot dot and hello. Now this is our indexed characters. And since it's an applicative now, we can simply apply sequence A to it. Hmm. For some reason, you can just easily do that. It type checks, but for some reason, it doesn't print anything. Maybe I have to show it. You cannot easily show it because we don't have a specific type for zero. Maybe I have to do it like so. Maybe because, oh, it just, it just inferred that the value of A is not just integer. It's just any number. It's an abstract number that probably uh, is not showable at all. And yeah, since I specify that it's an integer, now it's showable. And you see, it acts exactly as I wanted. So it collected all of the characters and it used zero as the position of the token. So if I start from five, it's still going to be five. It acts exactly as I wanted. So that means I can simply rewrite the implementation of make token like equal to sequence a that's it so i can just simply make a token out of it so how having a monoid actually turns that into an applicative having an identity element actually provide enough information to implement a pure operation you see, now as the initial element of the first element, it just takes the identity element, which is infinity for an integer. Integer is actually limited from a bow, so it's not an infinity, it's just a maximum value of integer. And also it provides enough information for another applicative operator on how to compose two applicatives. So let's say that we have a two plus one, which is indexed function, and we apply it on three, five. So I guess we have to probably specify in, uh, the type of this particular thing, which is a pair of two integers. Probably can easily do that. Yeah, 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 it has to be mean, mean, mean. It also provides information on how to compose these internal states of applicative. It basically takes a minimum between them. So if we swap them, so for example, if I put 10 here, it will choose three. So having a monoid here actually provides enough information to turn this entire pair into applicative. So this is not applicative, but this is. So this is really shows this that there is like a relationship between these two things, applicative and monoid, and I never knew about it until I accidentally discovered it. So I'm really curious how many such relationships there are.